Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's nice to meet you. It's been a while since I've been in front of the podium uh, in person. Uh, so my name is Philip Gagnon. I'm a solutions architect with Astronomer. Uh, I'm based in Montreal, Canada, because we're fully remote. And um, yeah, I mostly work on data platform architecture and uh, implementation previously in mostly heavily regulated industries, such as finance and healthcare. Uh, that's since 2017. And uh, mostly, you know, building stacks around uh, top tier open source projects, such as Apache Airflow that have great communities. All right, so what we're going to be covering today, um, essentially we're going to be talking about the logging architecture in Apache Airflow. So starting with logging in Airflow at a really high level, uh, then we'll move on with the default file-based logging process, explain how that works, and um, afterwards we'll look at different remote logging options to object storage and um, to dedicated indexing services. And afterwards we'll briefly touch upon how you can roll your own task handlers a task log handler if um, you're looking to implement a system that's not supported out of the box by Airflow. So Airflow logging at high level. Um, at a really high level, the process looks like this. Um, essentially, there's two type of logs in Airflow. So there's the Airflow components themselves, such as the web server, the scheduler, uh, the workers. Um, those essentially, those logs go to the root logger, which by default will output to the console. Now, Airflow task logs uh, use a different logger uh, configuration altogether, uh, and it's configured with what we call the task handler. Um, by default, the task handler will output logs to files in a directory structure, uh, which is defined by uh, your Airflow configuration. Um, now, one of the main features of Airflow is the ability to read task logs directly from the web UI, and um, this is implemented by an interface called the task log reader which, um, depending on its handler implementation, uh, will fetch logs from various locations. Um, this could be like either local or cloud storage, uh, the worker itself through the embedded web server in the worker, um, or the Kubernetes API uh, logs endpoint if you're running Kubernetes executor, or uh, an indexing service. Oh, that's a problem. One still. Uh, this is the slide that I was referring to originally. <laughs> um, so yeah, moving on to the Airflow logging core concepts. So um, Airflow logging is based on concepts from the Airflow, uh, sorry, the Python standard library logging module. Uh, and uh, its configuration is exposed in uh, true values that are available through airflow.cfg. Um, but the behavior is really customizable through Airflow local settings.py. So really the way that you should think about that is that the configuration itself, so the logger is configured in Airflow logging.py uh, using values that are uh, configured by the user in Airflow.cfg. Um, so yeah, the Python logging concepts that we exposed are the loggers themselves. Um, we essentially define three custom loggers in Airflow, which are the Airflow processor, the uh, Airflow task handler, uh, Flask app builder, which is essentially used for web server purposes. And uh, that goes along with the root logger, which is configured by default um, by the Python logging module. Um, we define a secret called a uh, filter called mask secrets and two formatters. Uh, one of them is called Airflow. That's basically what makes the logs look how they look like when you read them in Airflow. And um, Airflow colored, which uh, provides colors. Uh, mask secrets by default will be the facility that allows you to mask some secret values such as API keys, AWS access keys, connection passwords, and et cetera. And um, yeah, those are Python logging concepts. We'll essentially look at them a bit in a bit more details a bit later. Uh, with regards to task logs, retrieval relies on an extension to the standard library handler uh, spec in the sense that we implement a read method in the task, the task log handler. Um, and really the standard uh, logging classes are really only focused about output. Uh, subsequently, logs are displayed uh, by a class called task log reader, which the web server uses. And that's an interface which uh, calls the previously mentioned log method that's defined in the handler. So the configuration itself, how is it initialized? Um, essentially when Airflow launches, uh, we go through the initialized method that's defined in settings.py. Um, and uh, yeah, that's invoked. And then afterwards, that function will call configure logging from the logging config module. Um, that 
really doesn't do much because like the actual configuration happens in Airflow local settings.py. Um, but yeah, essentially what this method will do is that it's going to load a value from airflow.cfg that's called login class path. And um, that value should be set to a reference to a dictionary that contains the dict config, which is a configuration concept for the Python login module. And um, yeah, essentially that ref that con dict, which is referred to by that key in the airflow.cfg file, will be loaded, and that's what will be passed to Python login to basically configure login. If that key is not present, we'll just use default login config, which is defined in the template for Airflow local settings.py, and that's basically what defines the login configuration that we're used to when we install Airflow the first time around. So the dict config, essentially, um, that's a, uh, it's, it's essentially a JSON uh, value, and the schema looks like this. The four important values are formatters, filters, handlers, and loggers, which are the concepts that we talked about a bit earlier, but we'll talk about them in more details. So the logger exposes the interface that the application code directly uses. So uh, one particularity is that each logger has a name, uh, which is potentially hierarchical in the sense that it's essentially defined in the same kind of hierarchy that you would have a Python module. And um, a logger can be a child of another logger, and it's going to inherit parameters from that logger. And um, yeah, loggers are singleton as well. So basically, when you acquire a logger with a name, you're always going to get a reference to the same object. Uh, that's essentially your entry point to logging in Python as an application developer. That's what you're going to use to call, you know, info, error, et cetera, to uh, send logs to whatever destination is defined by your application. Uh, handlers send the log records that are created by loggers to their appropriate destination. And um, yeah, one thing to note is that there is no requirement for a logger to implement a single handler. So basically a logger can output to multiple destinations by defining multiple handlers. Uh, filters define a finer grain facility for determining which log records to output. Uh, and that's the mechanism that we use to ensure, to ensure that secret values aren't printed to logs because that's usually pretty bad. And uh, yeah, formatters, that's essentially the uh, format that specifies the uh, layout of the log records in the final output. That's how you make a log look pretty. Um, so yeah, out of the box, uh, Airflow ships with a big config configuration in default login config. And uh, yeah, that configuration by default is passed to login.config.digconfig, and that's what configured the whole logging stack in Python. Um, so yeah, by default, we define three handlers. Uh, so there's redirect std handler, which is used for the root handler and the fab app builder handler. So that outputs to the console, essentially. And then we also define file task handler for task logs and file processor handler for that processor logs. Um, essentially those wrap non-caching file handler, but that's really to fix a bug in Airflow where basically we're using a lot of memory for caching. And uh, redirect STD handler just outputs to standard error or standard, standard output. Uh, you can also think of the dig config, which is the JSON schema as a graph, and that essentially looks like this. So basically you've got the root logger from which every single other logger inherits. And in Airflow, by default, we configure Flask App Builder to inherit from root logger. Both of those use the um, uh, redirect STD handler, handler class. And then we've got two um, other handlers, or loggers, I mean, Airflow.task and Airflow.processor. Uh, Airflow.task for task logs, processor for that processor logs, and those inherit from uh, Airflow. But um, we don't really make use of that facility in Airflow uh, in any case. And then on the right of this slide, you can see that basically handlers um, are defined to uh, point to uh, different formatters. So for instance, file processor handler and file task handler use the Airflow formatter. Redirect the CD handler uses the Airflow caller and handler to provide callers to the console if you've configured it that way. And um, every single handler uses Secrets Masker because we really don't want secret values to show up anywhere. All right, so uh, let's talk about the file task handler to begin with. That's essentially the default uh, log handler that ships with uh, Airflow. And uh, if you don't replace it with another handler, that's what's going to be used. So it writes to your local file system. Um, it delegates to uh, file handler .emit. File handler is essentially the, uh, handler, the file handler that's provided by the Python logging module. And um, yeah, basically what it builds on top of the uh, file handler is that first off, there's logic embedded within to route logs to uh, 
uh, the proper file depending on the template that a uh, user is defining there for that CFG 3D log file name template setting. And that's used by a method called uh, done to render file name um, that basically renders file name for a log based on you know the task and task try um, in, in question. And uh, also there's uh, another private method called init file uh, that basically creates the log directory structure and permissions for the Airflow logs. And uh, yeah, that's what there is with the part. From the writing perspective, that's what we have on top of File Task Handler. Now, what gets a bit more interesting is that File Task Handler also implements read logic. So um, basically, this is the flow that happens when a user requests logs from the web UI, um, and uh, the File Task Handler is, is being used. So the user requests these task logs, and basically, if the handler is able to find logs on the local file system, and that would be the local file system accessible from the web server in uh, the location specified in the Airflow configuration. It's just going to read that file and display that to, back to the user. Uh, if it's unable to find the file locally in the web server's uh, file system, um, basically there's multiple options that are available. If the user has specified that this Airflow deployment is using the Kubernetes executor, um, and the worker pod still exists, we're going to read the pod logs from the Kubernetes API uh, log endpoint. And we're only going to be displaying the first 100 lines. And that's essentially, if it's not really a fallback mechanism, but it's a mechanism that's been implemented because in the past, uh, Kubernetes executor users had a lot of trouble getting access to their logs while their tasks were still running. Uh, if we're uh, unable to fetch Kubernetes executor uh, is being used and um, we're basically the worker but does not exist anymore, we're going to be unable to fetch the logs. And then after it's just a fallback mechanism in place in file task handler that basically um, will look for logs in other places. Um, if the Kubernetes executor is not being used, uh, we're essentially going to try to fetch the logs from the workers themselves. So the workers essentially run with an embedded web server that runs on port 8793, if I remember correctly. And it's the sole purpose of that web server is for the worker to be able to serve logs back to the web server for user requests, it, because it's not a given that the web server and workers will be running on the same machine or in the same environment. So the web server may not have access to the log files that it needs to display in, in most circumstances, actually. Um, the problem with the previous mechanism is that it forces the workers to handle long-lived state, um, which uh, can be kind of undesirable in instances when you're running Airflow at scale, for instance, in a containerized setup. Uh, most often in those cases, you don't necessarily want to handle state within your cluster. You really want to uh, offload the state management problem to a dedicated service. Uh, to alleviate that problem, it's possible to offload logging management to dedicated systems through the remote logging feature. Uh, that's enabled through Airflow.cfg, but really it's configured through AirflowLocalSettings.py once again. Uh, in AirflowLocalSettings.py, essentially there is an if-else block uh, contained in there that configures uh, remote task log handlers based on the uh, two settings that are found in Airflow.cfg, and that's remote logging and um, remote base log folder. Um, so yeah. Uh, in this slide, essentially, the second half of it displays the logic behind this process in Airflow local settings .py. Um, So yeah, if local if remote logging is enabled, um, I missed the order for this if else statement, but it doesn't matter. Um, we basically look um, at the remote base log folder um, value, and if depending on the scheme that it starts with, we'll essentially configure a uh, remote logging task handler based upon that. So basically, if a uh, remote base log folder starts with S3, we're going to configure the S3 task handler. If uh, it starts with CloudWatch, we'll essentially configure the CloudWatch task handler, and et cetera, et cetera. So we'll talk a bit more about remote logging to object storage. Um, there's various handlers implementing login to object storage. In most cases, users will use Amazon S3 or Google Cloud Storage or Azure Blob Storage. Uh, principally, that's what we see in the field. And um, yeah, it's what's really important to note with regards to remote logging is that this is a mechanism that only uploads log files to object storage when the log handler is closed. Uh, we'll see how that happens uh, in a minute. 
But um, yeah, basically when the application exits, the log handler is closed and that's what triggers the upload process to object storage. So uh, in some cases that can actually be an issue, for instance, if your task process is killed by your own, uh, your own killer, um, you may end up in a state where the task log handler is not closed properly and the log just won't show up in, in remote storage, which can be problematic. So we'll look at an example uh, using S3. Um, so yeah, basically the logging process uh, to make things a bit more concrete, um, S3 is probably the most common logging backend that we see in, in white usage. So we'll, we'll look at that flow. So while the task is running, logs are basically continuously output to a local file on the worker's file system using the usual file task handler mechanism. Uh, S3 task handler inherits from file task, S3 task handler inherits from file, file task handler. And um, it essentially uses the same mechanism uh, to output logs to the local file system. Uh, and yeah, like I said earlier, it gets interesting when the task exists, uh, whether successfully or unsuccessfully. At that point, the task log handler will be closed, and this will in turn uh, prompt the handler to upload the log files to S3 uh, using the S3 write method in the S3 task handler class. Uh, the task read process is similar in the sense that basically the task log handler uh, will implement the read method, and um, basically what that will do is check the uh, S3 for the existence of uh, the key that should pertain to the logs that it's looking for. If it's present, it's going to download that file from S3 and send it to the web server for display to the user. If it's not, it's just going to fall back to the file task handler mechanism. The other option that uh, is available with regards to remote logging or the other big family of remote logging uh, solutions essentially is uh, logging to an external indexing service. Uh, Airflow currently supports Elasticsearch, CloudWatch Logs, and um, Stackdriver, which is now called Google Ops Suite, um, but it's still called Stackdriver and Airflow. And um, yeah, one thing to note is that those log handlers really only implement read functionality and um, they, they defer to file task handler for, for writing. Um, what this means is that it remains the user's responsibility for writing to afterwards index the logs themselves and their indexing service by shipping them with the tools such as uh, Fluentd or Logstat. We'll look at that flow in a second. So let's take a look at an example with Elasticsearch. While the task is running, logs are streamed to a local file. So in order to ship logs to Elasticsearch, the uh, Airflow user will need to configure a log collector. In this case, I just uh, displayed FluentD, but it could also be Fluent Bit, Logstatch, or whatever service has uh, a similar service, similar purpose. And um, essentially, FluentD will watch the local log file as it's being written and ship log lines as they appear to Elasticsearch for indexing. Um, then afterwards, um, for reading, essentially, um, the Elasticsearch task handler will implement a private read method. And what that will do is uh, communicate with the Elasticsearch cluster and query it according to a log ID, uh, which is essentially a value formatted as DAG ID, dash task ID, dash execution date, task try number. Uh, in most cases, that's also customizable through the Airflow UI. And um, yeah, afterwards, using another value called uh, an offset that will basically define, uh, that's essentially a search query that will be sent and it's going to be ordered by an offset. And um, basically the task log reader afterwards will display those logs to uh, the, air, the user through the Airflow UI. Um, so yeah, this actually puts a lot of burden, a configuration burden on the user, um, but it does provide the most amount of flexibility with regards to logging, in, in my opinion. And finally, if we look at the interfaces uh, that you would need to implement if you were rolling your own log handler, um, essentially, if you're looking to implement logging to a system that's not currently available in Airflow, um, those are the methods that you would need to override. So uh, it's fairly simple, actually, but it can get complex in implementation. So uh, essentially, in everything from logging.handler, which is the handler interface for the Python logging handler, you've got three methods that were important in this case. So there's emit, uh, where basically you would put logic to stream logs to your remote system, if that's the route that you're going to. Close, um, 
which uh, would essentially contain the logic to ship logs in bulk to object storage if you were to decide that you want to ship them once the task has uh, is completed. And um, read where, it, where you would essentially define the logic um, to fetch your logs from your remote service. Um, but that's actually going the hard way. I think that most implementations within Airflow actually just decide to inherit from file task handler, uh, defer the problem of uh, writing logs to a remote service or a remote location to the user by deferring to a log shipping service. And basically, if you choose to go that, if you choose to go that route, such as uh, what uh, was selected for the Elasticsearch task reader, um, you basically only have to implement the read method to uh, send logs back to your user. And um, yeah, that's about it. Thank you so much.